In 2018, Elizabeth Brunig, who is a cultural and economic commentator, wrote an opinion column at the Washington Post called, We Are No Longer Capable of Forgiving One Another. We are no longer capable of forgiving one another. Brunig laments how both American political and American pop culture have become utterly incapable of even thinking about forgiveness. She writes, We are now always in some phase of this cycle of seeking out something to be offended by. There are all kinds of reasons these vindictive cycles of provocation and retribution are bad news for societies in general, but democracies in particular. There are undoubtedly bad lessons in civic virtue, but they're worse than that. They are terrible moral lessons and they make us into bad people. I think she's right in some sense. We see how this bad behavior of constantly being outraged and angry and out to get people has warped us and has changed us. And it's made our behavior, our hearts rather, follow our bad behavior. Not only do we see this constantly on the news, but we see it and social media, and if, we, if we're honest, we see it in ourselves and our daily interactions with one another. But always looking for a reason to be outraged, as Brunig points out, is not only bad for our society, it's bad for our soul too. She continues, The habit we're in of waging small-scale wars has made us nearly incapable of really holding our allies accountable or of really forgiving our enemies. Forgiveness means having the technical right to exact some penalty, but electing not to pursue it. This breaks the cycle of retribution with unearned, undeserved mercy. The face of forgiveness is bruised because it bears its own injuries with grace. So, doing so permits the cycle of retribution to go no further. It's a hard thing to do, but necessary if huge numbers of strangers are going to live peacefully together. What she's saying is if we ever hope to live in a world, in a society, in a country, just even in a church where we can live peaceably together. What she, su- what she su- suggests is necessary, and I think she's right about this, is that we have to learn to forgive one another. But what happens if society doesn't embrace this strategy of learning to forgive others? Because in some ways it seems like it's not learning that lesson. In some ways it seems like the retribution and vengeance and vitriol is getting worse and worse by the day. What happens when we totally reject the idea of forgiveness? Well, I'd like to suggest that this is not simply a modern problem, although it is one of our problems here in 2020 living in the United States. But it really, again, I think is a very deeply and timeless human problem. Because if you look at what the Bible actually thinks of people and their societies, it shows us that they are always and always have been and probably always will be in desperate need of and tragically incapable of forgiveness. Consider our passage this morning as an example in that, in which Jesus is condemned to die unjustly and how the rest of the Bible interprets the human guiltiness and putting Jesus to death on a cross. There is an opportunity here in our passage this morning for Jesus to be let go, to be quote-unquote, even though He was free of sin and had done nothing wrong, His enemies could have forgiven the grudge they had against Him. And Pilate was giving them a way out of it. And they elected instead of of letting go of their grudge, of repenting of their own sin to put an innocent man to death. They could have done something else about this, but they barreled ahead into crucifying 
the Lord of glory. Why is this? Why would human nature do this? Well, Peter, who just last week we saw uh, abandon Jesus after this bravado of always of going to, even into the, the jaws of death and to the gates of hell with Jesus, ran away because a little servant girl questioned him and he was frightened and ran out like the coward he was in that moment. But Peter, after seeing the Lord Jesus resurrected and ascended sometime later, has found a new life and vitality and strength. And he's able to go back into this same city that he fled from some days later where he sees at another feast at Pentecost not only the Jews but worshipers from all over the world. During the feast of Pentecost in Acts 3, he's able to look at all the leaders that he was so scared of, all the people, international people, Jews and Gentiles he was so afraid of, and he is able to say to them, Jesus, whom you all delivered to Pilate and whom you denied and whom you killed, the author of life. In other words, we too, just like Peter, just like Judas, just like Pilate, just like Herod, just like all the people in this passage have participated in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ because of our sin. So if all of humanity is indeed guilty of Jesus' death, both Jew and Gentile, both black and white, both male and female, both child and senior, both rich and poor, both liberal and conservative, if all of us are very guilty of the death of Jesus Christ, then what hope do we have? Well, Peter doesn't stop there. He doesn't simply point out the problem of sin in the human heart, but he goes on to give them good news in the middle of his sermon. He continues on in Acts 3, but God raised Jesus from the dead. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance. Perhaps that's our story too. Perhaps we act in ignorance. We do things that we think aren't that bad, but are an offense to God and really hurt our neighbor and even hurt ourselves. Perhaps we do act ignorantly. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that His Christ, that His Messiah would suffer, He thus fulfilled. So turn back that your sins may be blotted out. It's pretty, pretty gutsy of Peter to look at this crowd and say, you denied Jesus. When he quite literally did that very thing. But Peter was able to see, though he did that, and though we all do that in some sense, he turned back to the One who is able to blot out His sins, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that He may send the Christ appointed for you, those that put Jesus to death, Jesus whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things. Folks, humanity killed Jesus, but God resurrected Him. We had nothing but death and destruction in mind for God, for ourselves, for this entire planet, but God had different plans in mind. Humanity acted ignorantly, but God sent us the Holy Spirit to illumine our minds, to give us good news, to convict us of sin, but to give us the hope that the Gospel is for us because God and Jesus Christ is for us you. Humanity sinned and cut itself off from God willingly, whom Peter calls the author of life. But God gives faith to sinners so that their sins can be blotted out and that they may be refreshed in Christ's presence in their life even now and that Jesus may one day restore all things finally breaking the dreaded curse of sin and death in our lives forever. That's what Peter reminds us of. That although everyone is guilty, that God and Jesus offers every single one of us, no matter how guilty or guilty of what, 
forgiveness through putting our faith in Christ crucified. It doesn't matter in the end if you're a hypocrite from Wall Street or Main Street. It doesn't matter if you're a hypocrite from this little Baptist church or you have a hypocrite that's never even darkened the door of a church any day of your life. The Gospel of Jesus, condemned, crucified, risen, and reigning, is for you for this very moment and every other. Last week we saw how the highest, Jew, the, the highest courts in the land, the Jewish court in the land, the Sanhedrin with all of Israel's best and brightest, the scribes, the elders, and the priests, all banded together to find Jesus guilty of things He wasn't guilty of. And we also saw that Jesus' closest friend and ally, arguably Peter, vehemently denied Jesus, His ministry and His message. All of Israel, in other words, all of God's people for whom He came. Remember that the name Jesus that we hear in the Christmas story as Gabriel announces it to to Mary uh, is that Jesus will be named Jesus because He will save His people from their sins. That's why He came to save these people who have now betrayed their Creator and their King, both friend and foe alike. And now we read in verse 1 of this chapter that dawn is breaking on the Sanhedrin. They've sat up all night in an emergency session in this kangaroo court, judging Jesus unjustly. And all the people of Israel are scrambling to get this dark work done before the sun rises on their evil deeds. They've unjustly condemned Jesus in their court. But they want, so perhaps in some sense, to feel justified for their evil. They want the pagans, they want the Gentile Romans to finish the job, to beat and strip and humiliate Jesus and then murder this Messiah. So again, nobody in this story has their hands clean. Not just the Jewish people, but also the Romans. Neither Jew nor Gentile, pagan or God-fearer, ally or enemy. And remember that in chapter 10 of this book, Jesus testified already that He would be delivered over by Jewish leaders to Gentile, um, to Gentile rulers and leaders. And so this is not a surprise to Jesus, but it's a scandal to us who are now reading it. Every single person in this story, except for the one that's about to be crucified, is shamefully guilty. Jesus is gagged and bound and marched over to the steps of Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman governor in this region of Israel. Now Pilate has really no religious dog in this fight. But he does have a political one. Because he's been charged by Caesar himself. He's been charged to keep order in this part of the Roman Empire. And now seeing as thousands of visitors were coming into the city to celebrate this Jewish festival and feast of Passover, which is about to begin at at sundown on this very day, he has to act fast to quell a possible riot. So he's going to have to report back to Rome what's going on, and he sees something insane brewing beneath the surface here. And so immediately Pilate begins to question Jesus when he receives him. And what does he ask first and foremost? Pilate asks, is it true that you are king of the Jews? Notice here he doesn't ask if he's the Messiah. He doesn't ask if he's the Son of Man. He doesn't ask about those those questions that Scripture would have asked about Jesus because again, he doesn't really care about the religious implications of who Jesus is. He cares about the political ones. So he asks the politically pertinent question, Jesus, is it true that you're a king? Pilate needs to know if he is facing a political rival. Somebody that will challenge his own authority. And Jesus replies in in kind of a mysterious way here. He says almost nonchalantly, you've said so, Pilate. Why is this? Why would Jesus 
respond this way. I think it's because what Pilate means by king and what Jesus would mean by king are two totally different things. At the surface level, Pilate thinks that Jesus is being accused of claiming some kind of Jewish throne. That he, in in some way, is is going to act as a revolutionary that plans to uh, conspire against Rome and to to throw off the, the bonds of Roman rulership to bring down the Senate, to bring down the Emperor, to to do everything he can to destroy Roman power. That's what Pilate is afraid of. And who could blame him for thinking this? Even Jesus' own disciples are geared up to think this. They expect that Jesus was also supposed to be some kind of radical political revolutionary. So everybody, both Jew and Gentile, thinks Jesus' kingship is about His sitting in a palace of of, of brick and mortar and controlling an army of Israel to defeat any enemies with inside of its borders and and repel everybody out and have a perfect nation-state of Israel. But Jesus' kingship is so much more radical than that idea. His kingship is not simply one where he plays these silly little war games that our politicians love to get into, where it's just posturing and, and passing power and backhanded, uh, uh, back alley deals and, and, and underhanded schemes. That's not what Jesus is interested in. Because Jesus is claiming a kingdom and authority that belongs to God Almighty creator of heaven and earth. He is claiming a throne that's not just sitting in some city in the Middle East. No, Jesus is claiming a throne that resides in heaven where He can prop His feet up on the entirety of the earth. Jesus is claiming an authority that stands over and against all of humanity because of their complicity complicity with sin. Jesus is posturing Himself to be a king that puts everybody on trial because of their great treason against heaven. But Jesus' kingship, unlike the kingships of this world, is not meant to destroy or isolate or humiliate people. Quite the opposite. Jesus' kingship is meant to liberate and forgive and resurrect even his enemies. You want to know what real political leadership looks like? You want to know what real authority looks like? You don't look to Washington. You look to heaven. Where Jesus stands in authority, judging sin, but forgiving sinners. That's what real leadership looks like. We have settled for such a paltry sickly view of what it means like to be a leader in this world. I mean, we are scraping the bottom of the barrel these days when we have a God who stands in opposition to all the evil things we do and yet still loves and forgives us just as we are. Who in this world can offer you that but Jesus Christ and Him crucified? Jesus came into the world because it was and is desperately broken and twisted. Every one of us have been warped by our own sins and we have used our own willing desires to hurt one another and to offend God at every turn. And creation itself has been so broken and warped by sin, we see the consequences of it every year in our nation when we, ha- we go through our tornado seasons and our hurricane seasons and our wildfire seasons and add all to that, on top of that, new diseases that pop up and claim hundreds of thousands of lives that we have no control in stopping, it would seem. That's how broken creation is. What God created to be good and where we could live together in peace, we're at war with one another all the time, constantly being destroyed by the place that God made for us to live. But the message Jesus has 
and the message that he has been preaching throughout the whole book of Mark is that God will bring heaven back to earth so that all those terrible things that happen to us year in and year out, and all the terrible things we do so willingly year in and year out, all of those things can be forgiven and set right in Him. Pilate couldn't possibly understand a kingship that looks like this. He couldn't imagine such a great ruler and emperor as the Lord Jesus. Because no one has ever existed like Him. And not even Israel's religious scholars, to be quite frank, who've been looking for the Messiah for centuries now, not even they could see and understand what Jesus was doing with His authority. And instead, in verse 5, we read that Pilate is just simply amazed at Jesus. He couldn't find anything remotely problematic about Him. And so now he comes to talk to the crowd. He doesn't know what to make of Jesus, so I guess he'll just should set him free. But in verse 6, we read that it was customary for the Roman governor, that is for Pilate, to release one political prisoner of the people's choosing. See, Rome believed they had enough power, they had enough authority, that they could set one of their enemies free and still be totally in charge of the situation. That is kind of a, that's a significant power to flex. That you're so strong, that your military is so commanding. Yeah, you could let a revolutionary free. Yeah, you could let an insurrectionist free. We're too powerful. They'll never overcome us, even if they're walking the streets. It's a goodwill gesture that was meant to placate a restless people that were being ruled over by another empire. It's, it's, it's meant to cause the Jews to settle down a little bit and maybe think that life isn't so bad under the Romans. And so releasing a prisoner around Passover was the ultimate diplomatic move meant to quell any sort of unrest that would be happening in their borders. And the crowd begins to ask for Pilate to do this. And it dawns on Pilate that this is a perfect time for him to let this Jesus, whoever he is, go. In verse 9, we read that Pilate asked the crowd if they wanted him to release the king of the Jews. That's pretty amazing for him to say that. This king of the Jews. You want me to release this king of yours? He thinks that whatever Jesus means by the term king, that it is totally politically harmless. Little did Pilate know, and about 300 years from this date, Rome would be overturned. And not because there were swords and clubs and warfare and battles. It's because the Gospel would overcome even the Roman Empire with love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's how powerful the Gospel is. It's how subversive it is. It can exist in a place like Rome where they think this is just some silly little myth that people believe. And then in a matter of a matter of decades, the whole empire is turned upside down because of it. Verse 10 tells us that Pilate could tell that the only real thing that Jesus was guilty of was being more popular and more envious to Israel's people than their priests and their scribes, and that made them jealous. Jesus was so wonderful, such a good minister, such a loving friend, that it made all the pastors and it made all the judges angry that people loved Jesus. That's what Pilate was able to perceive. The biggest problem that Jesus was causing is that He was too wonderful for them to bear. But the crowd is absolutely disgusted by the suggestion that Jesus would be let go. By the way, this same crowd is the one that just last week in the story, welcomed Jesus with open arms, waving palm branches. Hosanna! He's here! Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus shows up and starts rebuking them for their hypocrisy, and they say, okay, well let's kill Him instead. There's religion for you folks. That's what it has to offer. 
well, yeah, we'll play along with God's game. We'll follow and be obedient as long as we get what we want out of it politically. But if we don't, we'll put Him to death. That's the human heart in a nutshell. This crowd begins to chant. They, they do ask for somebody to be set free. And they say, give us Barabbas. Who is Barabbas? We read just earlier that Barabbas was an actual, real-life rebel and, and probably some would call him a terrorist against Rome. So who did they want free? The person that if he got his will would act against Rome in such a way that he would bring all the heat and ire and anger of Rome's armies down on Jerusalem. That's the person that they want running free. That's who the crowd clamors for. He's an actual murderer. He, Romaned a murder, he, he murdered a, uh, a Roman in a failed mutiny against the empire. In other words, here is the actual threat against Rome. Here is the actual threat also against Jerusalem. They let people like this go about. And yet they want Him released. Give us Barabbas, they cry. Not Jesus. And this is stunning to Pilate. It's shocking. What am I supposed to do with this king of yours? He asked them. They only have one solution for Jesus. Crucify Him, they call out. So not only are they asking a murderer to go free, but now they are wanting to become like that murderer and murder an innocent man themselves. Pilate can't believe what he's hearing. In verse 14, he asks, why? What evil has this Jesus done? It's a good question that Pilate asks the crowd. It's a good question that Pilate asks us. What evil has this Jesus done, 21st century person? That you rebel against Him. That you want Him out of your life. That you want Him squashed. What is Jesus actually guilty of doing? How does the crowd respond? Well, he's guilty of blasphemy. No, not really. Well, he's guilty of causing civil disobedience. No, not really that either. But this mob of Israel's highest ranking leaders and its blue collar workers, class doesn't seem to matter here. Everybody comes together in one ecumenical effort and they don't answer Pilate's question. They don't tell him what they think Jesus is guilty of. This is their answer. Why? What evil has Jesus done? And the crowd says, crucify Him. He has done no evil. There is nothing that they can hold against Jesus. But the will of this crowd is to crucify the Lord of glory. So Pilate, not wanting to deal with this mess any longer, and definitely not wanting to upset this constituency that is on the verge of tearing this city down, well, he delivers a guilty man into the crowd and prepares Jesus, the innocent God-man, to be slaughtered. He doesn't just give him over. He beats and whips him first and then hands him over. This is an absolute disaster. That's not even a strong enough word for what we're seeing here. Because Jesus, who we've witnessed all throughout Mark's Gospel as healing people, as casting out their demons, of restoring them to their family and friends, and raising them from the dead and forgiving them of their sins against God and man, all while preaching the kingdom of God is on its way for them and they get to be participants in God's new world. Jesus, this one, has been failed now by two courts. Jesus was mocked in the Jewish Sanhedrin about being the Messiah, and then Jesus was mocked again in the Roman Praetorium about being the King. Notice what happens to Jesus now that He's been turned over to the Roman soldiers. Like the Jews before in our passage last week, they beat Him and spit on Him 
and utterly humiliated. They add insult to entry. They, they, they put a, a purple robe on his shoulders to mock him. They press a crown on his head, not one of gold, but of one of thorns, till his brow is bleeding and blood is getting into his eyes and he can't even see straight. And they bowed and laughed and sang their songs, hailing him the King of the Jews. Peter, who was Mark's friend and mentor and eyewitness source of many of the events we read about in this Gospel, and Jesus' denier, he stands before a diverse group of sinners about 50 days later and preaches how all of humanity, Jew and Gentile, is guilty of killing the very author of life and of crucifying the very King of the universe. The greatest act, the greatest event that we could conjure, the greatest response as human beings to God walking on our midst is putting Him on a cross. That's our response to Jesus. This time of year when we celebrate Christmas and we're, we're looking forward to all the joy, we put up lights and and beautiful decorations, and, and wreaths, and candles, and all these things, we remember the way our default nature towards God has always been resistant. Jesus comes to be born into our world, and we say, you can go out in the animal stall and be born out there. That's what we think of you. At the end of His life, we think, we'll hang you outside of the walls of Jerusalem. We're going to put you on a dead tree that we rip down and, and we're going to nail you to that. And we'll hang you there naked and throw rocks at you and spear you in the side and then throw you in a dark hole. That's what we think of God as human beings. But by the end of Peter's sermon, although he convicts every single person there as just as guilty as if they were Pilate trying to wash away all that blood on their hands, and my goodness, isn't that how we are every day? Trying to convince ourselves we're good people. All the terrible things we do, all the, the impatience, all the anger, all the bitterness and animosity and lies and slander and gossip, all those things that we do to each other just so commonly every day, we try to wash our hands of that. Pretending like that we're good people and of our own accord. But Peter preaches this sermon in earnest. And he looks at a very guilty crowd of all kinds of people from Egypt, from Africa, from Asia, from Turkey, from Europe, from Rome. He looks at people from all over the world of every stripe and preaches this message that they killed the King of the universe. But that's not the end of the story. Because He lets them know, although that's what we brought to the table for God, God brought resurrection to the table for us. And by the end of Peter's sermon, 3,000 people of every nation, every tribe, and every tongue believe that Jesus is not just the Messiah of the Jews, but is the Christ of the world. That is the King of the universe. Because God raised that Jesus from the dead. And now His Spirit reveals to them in Peter's sermon that Jesus really is the King. Who did Jesus die for? Who did Jesus rise for? Was it the good religious people? Was it the important political people? Was it the people that have always gone to church and paid their taxes on time and always voted the correct way? and said they don't need Him. Jesus lived and died and rose for the worst of the worst people that have ever lived. He came to seek and save not the worthy, not the honorable, not the noble, not the rich, not the educated. He came to seek and to save the worst of the worst sinners. To love and forgive the guiltiest of the guilty. Why? Because God is love. And that counts even 
for sinners such as us. We talked earlier in the sermon about cultural forgiveness. But we don't always find forgiveness in this life for our sins from each other. It feels, I think, in recent years as if we've gone absolutely out of control with outrage and anger towards one another. I've never seen anything like it in my lifetime. In fact, sometimes, I hate to say it, it seems to me that the cruelest people I've ever met tend to also be the most religious. But the good news, folks, is that Jesus didn't come for self-righteous people that think that they don't need Him and pretend like they aren't also sinners. He came to find people that would admit just how broken and sinful they are. Just how often they constantly fail and how miserable they are in their sins. He came to find those people and to love and to forgive and resurrect them for all eternity. That promise is for you right now. Don't hold on to your religiosity. Don't hold on to your status in the community or your family or whatever you hold dear. Don't look to your career. Don't look to your savings account to give you any value or worth. Those things are fleeting. Look instead to Jesus. This is why Peter, who is a fellow sinner with us, tells us just to admit our sin and turn to Jesus. Who else would be a better authority on that than the one who denied his Lord three times on the day he was supposed to be crucified? Who else could tell us more about love and forgiveness than Peter, who watched Jesus go to his death and did nothing? The Peter whom Jesus three times later asked, do you love me? See, Peter denied Jesus and said, essentially, effectively, I don't love the Lord three times to witnesses. And Jesus' response to that, instead of casting Peter into hell where he belongs, he looks at Peter and asks him, do you love me three times? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. Peter even gets a little short. Still haven't not learned his lesson. Gets a little impatient with his own Lord and Savior. But Jesus overwrites Peter's sin. Peter says, Lord, I don't love you three times. And then Jesus three times says, Peter, do you love me? Giving him the chance to say, yes, Lord, I do love you. That's how the Lord treats our sin too. We may deny Him, and then He overwrites it with His own Word, reminding us that He loves us. Because Jesus loves and forgives sinners, we don't have to hold on to anything that we feel like gives us strength, any sin that we feel like elevates us. Instead, we can look to Him who goes to a cross in order to die and to also take with Him on the cross our guilt forever. And to the surprise of the Jewish priest and the Roman governors, that is exactly how Jesus Christ is King both now and forever. You want to see where Jesus is inaugurated, it's not in Him marching and up to Pilate's mansion and casting out all His servants and executing Pilate and sitting on His throne. No, Jesus is inaugurated as King of the world when He goes to the cross with a crown of thorns on His head and dies for the sins of all. That's what real kingship looks like. And folks, on this third Sunday of Advent, when we hear about the injustice of Jesus' final moments on earth and His final sentencing from Pilate of death and crucifixion, we can still indeed take joy. Why? Because the author of Hebrews writes, we look to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand and throne of God forever. This Jesus 
is to whom we look. We spend our lives perhaps mocking Him, mocking His way, mocking His message, but He looks to us in pity and compassion, going to a cross with joy in His heart, knowing even though we're turning on Him, that He knows that His Gospel will turn us towards Him. Let's pray. Father, we are guilty of sin in thought, word, and deed. We have failed ourselves. We have failed each other. And worse of all, Lord, we have failed You. But Lord, in Your infinite mercy and love, You sent Your Son, our Savior, Jesus the King, to live for us, to die in our place, and to rise again from the grave, so that in Him we may too one day rise. Help us to, as the Hebrews tell us, consider Him who endured from sinners such hostility against Himself so that we may not grow weary or faint-hearted. For it's in the joy of Jesus' name that we now pray. Amen.